Lecture 17, Deadlock. Uh, so this is Deadlock... No, no, that's Deathstroke. Uh, close. Let's try again. Okay, this is Deadlock... No, that's Deadpool. Um, we're, we're getting closer, I guess. This is Deadlock. Yeah, actually, this is an actual superhero named Deadlock, or he might be a villain, I don't know. Um, he's no character of any particular importance. Uh, as far as I can tell, he's just some sort of, like, dollar store Wolverine. Um, but, hey, his name is Deadlock. So, yeah. 10 out of 10. Okay. Um, yeah, Skeptical Dog has the, uh, has the correct... Uh, version. He first appeared in 1992 as an image comics character. I've got nothing uh, to explain why or what he's for. Okay. Um, so, uh, we've previously talked about Deadlock, and I gave an informal definition of Deadlock that said, look, Deadlock is what happens when uh, some threads get stuck, uh, and they get stuck forever. No, they will never get unstuck uh, because there's nothing that can make that happen. Okay. We need a uh, more formal definition of that, but our best way of getting there uh, is to talk about our third classical synchronization problem, and that is the dining philosophers problem. Uh, and the dining philosophers problem was also proposed by Dijkstra. It's another one from 1965. Uh, in principle, you may uh, pose this problem as having an arbitrary number of philosophers, n, uh, but it's usually described as five because it makes it nice to like draw the diagram and uh, you know, visualize what's going on. So usually we just choose five, but remember that this is you know, without uh, any loss of generality. So if, uh, if I said there were 10 philosophers or 20 or 13 philosophers doesn't matter accomplishes the same goal as long as there's non-zero philosophers okay so the five very smart individuals spend their lives thinking but every so often they need to eat uh, and they share a table each having his or her own chair uh, and at the center of the table there is a bowl of rice, and it is laid with five single chopsticks. So they're eating at the worst restaurant in the world. Uh, there is one uh, communal bowl of rice, uh, and everybody has a chopstick singular. There's a visual representation uh, of what is supposed to happen. So there is the rice in the center, every philosopher has their own little bowl, and they, you know, there are five chopsticks on the table, one for each seat. Those with uh, a certain amount of familiarity for uh, uh, what chopsticks are for and how to use them will, of course, have recognized immediately that mm, we have a suspicious shortage of chopsticks, uh, that it's not really plausible to eat rice with one chopstick. But okay. When a philosopher wishes to eat, uh, then, you know, let's say it's philosopher one uh, up here in the uh, top left area. Uh, she sits down in her designated chair, attempts to pick up the chopsticks on her left and right, the ones that are nearest to her, uh, and uh, will then, if she's got both of them, will be able to get some rice and eat. Now, um, we will assume a couple of things. One is that the restaurant has hygiene standards, so if you put down the chopsticks, they'll be sanitized immediately. So that, of course, a neighbor uh, can use it without that being, like, weird and gross. Um, the other thing is that philosophers are polite, and they therefore do not grab chopsticks out of the hands of a colleague. I don't have a tremendous amount of personal experience with philosophers, but I'm guessing that, you know, they respect this level of decency. So when a philosopher has two chopsticks, that philosopher can eat. Uh, and so if it's philosopher one and she eats rice, uh, then she can finish, put the chopsticks down, and then go back to thinking about whatever it is philosophers think about. Uh, although the best thing I ever read uh, about uh, philosophy came from, I think, a Philosophies for Dummies book that said there are only three questions that are important in philosophy. Why? Why not? And will this be on the exam? Okay. So, yeah, we have some ground rules for dinner time. A philosopher sits in their designated chair, try to pick up the nearest chopsticks, uh, and uh, if you have both, you can eat. If not, you have to wait. 
Um, so imagine, if you will, that you know this is a computer type problem, and we're going to use semaphores to manage it. Um, and uh, you will then think of a chopstick being represented by a semaphore, uh, because well, a person can you know, be holding onto this chopstick, and it can only be held onto by one person at a time. So a binary semaphore type construct is sufficient. So when a philosopher sits down, he attempts to acquire the left chopstick, then the right chopstick, then tries to eat, then puts the chopstick down. This works fine, unless and until all of the philosophers sit down at the same time, uh, and if they all grab the chopstick on their left individually, then every philosopher is holding one chopstick, and none of them are able to acquire the other one, the one on their right, because of course it's being held by a colleague. Uh, and then everybody is stuck. Everybody is holding on to one chopstick, and nobody can get a second one, nobody can eat. Some textbooks um, formulate this problem as philosophers needing two forks to eat rather than chopsticks. Um, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, it's much easier to imagine uh, a uh, difficulty in eating with only one chopstick as opposed to eating with only one fork. Uh, you know, only one fork. I mean, what, what would they say in the fancy magazine? Um, the scenario is obviously silly. We don't study this scenario because it's supposed to be a true-to-life model of how philosophers behave. Um, you know, surely in real life this would not be a problem. If a restaurant that somehow only gave each guest one chopstick would go out of business. Um, there's nothing to... There's nothing to say this scenario has to be realistic. We just need the model to be applicable to some real-world scenarios, uh, and it helps if this model is memorable. Um, it, it helps it to stick in your mind uh, to understand, oh, well, this is you know, the dining philosophers. So this is a sort of true-to-life model where there are perhaps not enough resources to go around, uh, and if uh, everybody gets a piece of it, then uh, that, that might not make anybody happy. You know, there are some resources that can't be distributed evenly, because then nobody is happy. Uh, if resources are distributed a bit more unevenly, then some people are at least happy and some people are unhappy. But you know, that's, um, that's the uh, unfortunate reality uh, of these kinds of things. Uh, reality is, is rarely particularly fair. So, okay. Um, deadlock at the dinner table. Uh, the phrasing of the dining philosopher's uh, problem makes it, I think, a little clearer why we call the situation where a thread never gets a chance to run starvation. That is, if a philosopher never is able to acquire both chopsticks, they won't eat. And although I'm not an expert on biology, I have it on good authority that people who don't eat anything do eventually starve to death, even if they are philosophers. So we could uh, be concerned uh, about that happening. Deadlock you know, means nobody eats, but starvation could be that you know, one philosopher is always unlucky and never gets the chopsticks and you know, doesn't ever get to eat. That wouldn't be good either. Um, no, not, not for that philosopher anyway. So we could start to think about some strategies to avoid it. Uh, it is important to remember in this case that our philosophers are threads and not people. Uh, if two people are in conflict for a resource, you know, they have the ability to sort of look outside themselves and say, well, uh, I noticed that you have one chopstick and I have one chopstick and we can you know, devise some sort of scheme in which we negotiate amongst ourselves who gets the chopsticks and you know, that would eventually produce a solution. The threads do not have this luxury. They can only do what their program code tells them to do, and they can't, you know, sort of put a pause on what they've been told and say, wait a minute, I think this is, you know, going to lead to a problem. So we have to work within the constraint that threads don't have this ability to just negotiate with one another uh, arbitrarily the way actual people would. Um, you could make jokes, I suppose, about whether philosophers would be able to agree on what is an equitable system for distributing who gets what chopstick, because, of course, they don't necessarily have an agreed definition of what is fair. We'll save that discussion for your complementary studies elective should you take a philosophy course. This will not be on the exam.
And when I say this, I mean the philosophy of whether or not uh, any philosophers could uh, interact. The dining philosopher's problem itself could certainly be on an exam. Okay, so here's a thing you can do. Hire a bouncer. Uh, and this you know, large and intimidating individual uh, just stands uh, in the way and allows exactly one person at a time to go to the table. Well, I mean, that'll work. Um, this allows exactly one philosopher at a time to eat. When their turn is up, you know, they put the chopsticks down, they leave. The next philosopher will show up and take their seat and, and so on. Uh, and it guarantees that we will not have a deadlock and it guarantees we will not have starvation. So it is a solution. It is not a good solution. We could do better than this. But it is a solution if the only things you need to do are avoid those two problems. So, yeah. Um, we've got a, uh, we've got a start. We know that the problem can be solved, but could we improve on this? Uh, and the answer is, I think, yes. Uh, there's five seats and five chopsticks, and yet only one person is eating at a time. Uh, and could we improve on that by increasing the number, by you know, letting the bouncer, uh, allow more than one person to sit at the table? And if so, how many? Well, what if we limit the number of philosophers at the table concurrently to four? So um, you could make a, a similar argument about two uh, as you did with one. You know, they sit down at the table. Uh, you could say, well, both of them will be able to eat. But that might not be true, actually. Because if the uh, two philosophers who sit down at the table are seated next to one another, they are in conflict over the chopstick that is between them. And if that is the case, then they will eat sequentially as opposed to concurrently. Uh, if they are sitting farther apart at the table, then yes, it's quite possible that they can both eat concurrently. So if we're willing to accept uh, that um, you know, it doesn't require that all the philosophers can eat concurrently, because that would be impossible, there aren't enough chopsticks for that, then um, we could go up to four. Uh, and the reason we can go up to four uh, refers back to the pigeonhole principle, something you may have learned about in discrete mathematics, uh, if you had a course that covered that, which is that if there are k pigeonholes, you know, these are little cubbies that pigeons like to go in because they're birds. Um, I don't know how birds think either. Um, <laughs> this is uh, a recurring theme in this lecture. But if there are k pigeonholes and more than k pigeons, then at least one of these holes has at least two pigeons, right? There's no way that uh, any, uh, any pigeonhole... Uh, uh, so there, there's no way that all the pigeonholes could be exactly one because that last pigeon, if there are k plus one pigeons, has to be somewhere. Uh, and so if there are four philosophers and five chopsticks, that means that at least one of the four philosophers is capable of getting two chopsticks. Which one it is depends on, of course, who is missing from the table. Uh, but as long as it's the case, if there are five chopsticks and four philosophers and they try to pick them up, somebody will eat uh, and that will work. So, uh, actually, what's even better about that is it's not just um, it's not just that uh, any one of them will eat, but it's actually that everybody among the four will be able to eat, because if only one philosopher gets two chopsticks, they will eat. They will put the chopsticks down, and then they become available for other philosophers, potentially unblocking one of them. Uh, and uh, you could have two philosophers that are eating at the same time, again, depending on when they pick up their chopsticks. But whatever happens, at least one philosopher will be able to get both. Uh, and when that happens, they can eat, they can leave, and that frees up these resources for other philosophers, meaning they too will eventually get to eat and leave. So implementing that is easy. You would just protect the table with a uh, less strict bouncer, a general semaphore with the initial value of four. Uh, and that would do the trick. Okay. One of the things that um, we might observe about this problem uh, is that it only happens when our timing is, let's call it, unfortunate. Uh, it occurs because every philosopher tries to pick up the left chopstick first, and not only that, at the same time. So it turns out that one of the solutions to this is invite a left-handed person to the table. That is, if, if a right-handed person picks up the left chopstick first and then the right one, but a left-handed person does the opposite, 
then deadlock will not occur. Uh, and we're not quite ready to uh, look into just why that will uh, not happen yet, but uh, it is something you should keep in mind. It's worth noting, incidentally, that if everybody at the table is left-handed, we have the exact same problem as if everyone at the table is right-handed. Uh, what is important is that at least one person is left-handed and at least one person is right-handed. After that, you could have any mix of left and right-handed people, uh, and you would still uh, end up not causing the deadlock. But okay, um, we have a hopefully reasonable understanding of how does the dining philosopher's problem work, what does it mean, and you know, what, what scenario should we be imagining in our heads. Uh, and therefore, it allows us to launch into our actual formal discussion about both deadlock and starvation. So it's time to do away with the informal definition of deadlock that I gave earlier. Uh, and I just said all processes are being stuck. Uh, and stuck in this case means unable to proceed. The formal definition is the permanent blocking of a set of processes that either compete for system resources or communicate with each other. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's a textbook definition quite literally because it comes from an operating system textbook. Um, but you could um, imagine threads in there instead of processes as well. Uh, either of those is fine. Now, um, the emphasis on permanent uh, is important, and I went over that a little bit earlier, uh, which is that it's possible for all of your processes or all your threads to be stuck at the moment, but if it resolves itself because, oh, a disk read completes or something like that, that isn't a deadlock uh, because, well, quite frankly, it's not permanent. Uh, what is permanent is something along the lines of when a thread is waiting on a semaphore, uh, but there will never be a post on that semaphore because the thread that should be uh, posting on it is blocked somewhere else, again, permanently uh, waiting for the first thread. So, yeah, if the situation is going to resolve itself, it's not a deadlock, and we shouldn't treat it like that. Those are the kinds of things where if we just wait, it will go away. Uh, well, we're fortunate if that's the case, but we're here to talk about deadlock. So, yeah, a set of processes is truly and meaningfully deadlocked when uh, each process in the set uh, is blocked waiting on some event, and that event can only be triggered by another process that's also in that set. So if A is waiting for B, B is waiting for C, and C is waiting for A, that's a real deadlock, because we can never break out of that loop, because what we would need to break out of that loop isn't going to come, because you know, it's a uh, paradox, if you will. You know, Who goes first? Um, they just don't. So that won't work. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to need to uh, analyze to find out you know why are our processes stuck if they are uh, and we may make a determination that it is actually a deadlock if they are stuck waiting for one another um, and ultimately whatever problem we have uh, a deadlock is uh, based around conflicting needs for resources by two or more processes or two or more threads. Uh, and that makes sense you know, if we remember, of course, that you know, something like a semaphore is a resource uh, or a, um, a file is a resource, something like that. Those are resources that we could you know, get blocked waiting for them. Uh, and if we do, it could lead to a deadlock. Okay, so maybe I'll illustrate a little bit more uh, about deadlock with this um, entertaining diagram. So a deadlock really does require conflicting needs for resources uh, for two or more processes. And we're going to consider a traffic deadlock. Let's imagine this is a four-way stop intersection. Uh, we can divide the uh, paths through the intersection into four quadrants. They're labeled A, B, C, and D in the uh, left side of the diagram. Um, now, to drive straight through the intersection, you need the two quadrants that are immediately ahead of your vehicle. So if you are vehicle one, you need quadrants A and B to drive through the intersection. If you are vehicle two, you need B and C. If you are vehicle three, you need C and D. And if you are vehicle four, you need D and A to get there. 
Okay. So, um, if you uh, drive in the province of Ontario, you should be familiar with the, the law called the Highway Traffic Act, which more or less uh, covers uh, this scenario to some extent. It says that uh, if... Um, two vehicles arrive at a stop sign at the same time, uh, then you know, the precedence goes uh, such that the vehicle on the left yields the right of way to the vehicle on its right. That works as long as th uh, that works as long as three or fewer vehicles arrive at the same time. I should add that you know, if you arrive at the stop sign first, uh, then you know, that means you go first even if you're on the left, but uh, this isn't a, a driver's ed class, uh, obviously. Um, if, it, if it were, I would probably be doing a better job of this. Uh, but in any case, um, you will encounter a situation if you drive enough and long enough uh, in which you have four vehicles come to uh, and always stop at exactly the same time. Uh, and then we have a problem. If there were three of them, well, the one on the left yields to the one on the right, yields to the one on their right, and you know, everything will work out okay. No issue. But when there's four of them, we have a loop, uh, and that's bad. Okay, so when we're in that situation, deadlock is possible, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and you may encounter uh, in this situation a lot of, you know, people honking and waving and sort of stopping and starting and, you know, trying to go and then seeing, oh, they think somebody else is going. Uh, and it just generally, um, well, ends up kind of a mess because you know, we're not prepared for this eventuality. But um, with that in mind, um, nothing bad has actually happened until we end up in the state B on the right here, uh, which is if everybody decides, well, I got here first, I'm the most important, and they drive forward, you end up with this. Uh, and then nobody can continue because they you know, can't get the resource that they need. Like vehicle one has acquired the resource A, that part of the intersection, but they can't get B because it's currently being held by the vehicle number two. Uh, and vehicle two has B but wants C, but it can't have C because C is acquired by vehicle three. Vehicle three wants D, can't have it because D is acquired uh, by four. And four wants A, but can't have it because, well, vehicle one already has it. So yeah, we have a deadlock here because you know every thread is, or every vehicle is waiting for another thread that has a resource that it needs. I mean, what happens in this scenario? The answer is probably road rage. Um, you know, people get mad about this, and you know, hopefully uh, it, it doesn't escalate. Um, but we don't have a a good solution to get out of it. Now, in your vehicle, you have the option of you know reversing, for example. Um, if you were vehicle one and you're like, well, I'd like to get out of this uh, out of this problem, uh, you could potentially reverse. Threads don't really have a good way to do that. You can't like undo some execution. That's just you know hard. Um, so I, it's not impossible. We're, we'll learn about that later on. Um, but that's a possibility. This also highlights why uh, if different vehicles do different things, uh, you don't get the same problem. Like, for example, if Vehicle 1 wanted to make a right turn, uh, the vehicle needs only Quadrant A to actually carry that out, uh, and then a deadlock would not occur because, well, we wouldn't have a problem. We you know, are not uh, deadlocked for these resources because Vehicle 1 could make its right turn. That would free up space for Vehicle 4 which would then proceed freeing up space for vehicle three and then two would get to go last uh, and in the end everybody gets where they need to go uh, and you know, no um, no road rage need occur so that's good um, in a pseudocode example um, we'll end up looking uh, something well, like the uh, thing we're going to see on the next slide. Um, it's important to um, remember that you know, when we look at this example, it is also like the dining philosopher's problem because everybody tries to do the same thing at the same time. Now, um, for a deadlock to occur, it is not a requirement that everybody is symmetric and you know, doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Uh, in fact, most deadlocks you look at probably won't be like that, uh, just because uh, behavior of different threads will be different. Uh, and given two semaphores, A and B, and two processes or two threads, you can have the following code, which will sometimes but not always lead to a deadlock. 
we have on the left side here uh, weight uh, A for thread P and weight on B and then the critical section signal A and signal B uh, and then for thread Q we have weight on B followed by weight on A and perhaps most of the time everything is fine uh, you know the, there's no deadlock that occurs but if the thread P acquires A and then there's a uh, switch over to B and B runs and it acquires B deadlock will occur because uh, whichever thread wants to run next cannot proceed it gets blocked uh, and then the other thread will get blocked when it runs and before you know it there we are we're stuck again so yeah that's not good um, you know, this problem is very easy to see right when you look at the two of them side by side you can say well yeah um, I recognize that you know the uh, behavior of thread P is to lock A then B and the behavior of thread uh, Q is to lock B then A and that's inconsistent and we should change it and it should be correct uh, and your definition of correct might not be the same as everyone else's you might say well actually what I think should happen is that it should be in alphabetical order because you would say well alphabetical order is logical so first wait A then wait B uh, and that is simple and correct you might have also chosen reverse alphabetical order the likelihood of you wanting to choose this probably increases dramatically if your name is at the end of the alphabet just saying but that would also be okay that would also avoid the problem we'll see again later on uh, a formalization of why we know that is the case and how we can be sure that the problem will not recur uh, if we are consistent in our ordering um, but it might occur to you to do that thing is that names aren't always a good choice for this um, if you have you know semaphores that are defined as global variables or something or mutex that's defined as a global variable um, it's it's easy if they all have unique names it's no big deal if however we're talking about bank accounts uh, and the bank account structure includes a lock well you know, it, it isn't obvious what the correct acquisition order is in that regard because well you know, they're both named lock for example you know there's account a and there's account b or something you know there's sender and there's recipient and you might say oh well, i could look at the names of the variables but uh you know like sender and recipient but even that won't save you so we'll uh revisit that topic uh in a little bit more detail uh, when we uncover a bit more formally how to stay out of trouble but it is possible uh, just keep in mind that uh, for two threads that don't have the same workflow to end up with this and uh, even if even if you have this uh, behavior where mutexes all have unique names you might not be able to see it because they're not necessarily next to each other right the the lock here for this mutex might take place in this thread in this function and then you know call some other function and it does some other thing and it locks the mutex and it's not like on the same screen with the definition of the other thread that does these in the reverse order uh, if it is you know it's obvious you'll spot it you'll fix it but in real life it's rarely the case okay now I've said that a deadlock occurs when processes are conflicting over resources and that is in fact the case but I didn't actually give you a good definition of resources uh, I mean I've talked about here's an example of a resource um, but we haven't really gone into the detail about it now generally a resource is classifiable as one of two things it is either reusable or consumable a reusable resource um, you know, good for the environment I guess uh, can be uh, used by one process at a time and it's not depleted so you can lock a resource make use of it and then release it such that other processes may acquire it uh, and there's lots of resources of that type in your computer uh, the CPU is this kind of resource you can use the CPU for a period of time uh, and then release it so other processes are able to run actually don't choose to release it but you know that happens memory is like this you can acquire memory with malloc you can make use of it while you need it and then you can deallocate it when you're done uh, and that really releases that memory to be used by something else semaphore you can wait on a semaphore and a lock a mutex anything like that uh, and when you unlock the mutex the mutex is not harmed by this uh, it goes back to how it was before the other kind of resource is 
consumable. And consumable resources are created and they eventually go somewhere and they are consumed and they are destroyed upon consumption. So a keyboard uh, interrupts, so it delivers some keyboard data, user press the Z key on the keyboard, this generates an interrupt and it produces a Z character in a buffer, and the thing is it goes to whatever program has focus at the time when the user presses the key that is consumed by that process. If you have an editor window open and you are typing text into the editor, the Z key goes into the, uh, the Z input character goes into the editor window and it doesn't go to any other process. And so uh, a consumable resource is used up in that sense. Uh, and there are lots of other uh, consumable resources. Uh, any interrupt is consumable. Post on a semaphore, a message, uh, if you were putting it in interprocess communication, is consumable. Um, a deadlock can happen regardless of what kind of resource things you're looking for. Um, you know, if... Um, if you are expecting a post and it doesn't happen, yeah, I mean, we end up with a deadlock because, oh, you know, we forgot it. We ended this function early uh, and we forgot to uh, post on the semaphore before we left. Then, yeah, a uh, consumable resource doesn't occur and, and we don't get it. And because we don't get it, we end up kind of stuck waiting for it because you know, this just is necessary and it hasn't happened. Um, but uh, you can have lots and lots of uh, deadlock scenarios that involve either consumable uh, or re reusable resources. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, it is just important to keep in mind there is a distinction between the two. All right. Now, when a disaster happens, you know, bridge falls down, robot arm goes through the wall, whatever it is, um, it is typically... A result of a chain of things going wrong. It's very rarely the case that like one single thing leads directly to a disaster. Uh, we try as best we can to uh, design things such that this doesn't happen. Uh, and usually when there is a failure and a kind of catastrophic one, it means that a number of things have gone wrong. Uh, if, uh, if you have uh, watched the... Uh, HBO special Chernobyl uh, might give you an example if you've ever uh, read up about the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Again, it would give you an example uh, where there are a number of steps that have to take place uh, and it is a chain of events. So first this happens and then that happens and then another thing. Uh, and most of the time anyway, somewhere along the way, there was a point or multiple points at which the disaster could be averted and this is referred to as breaking the chain. Uh, and if you can break the chain, you can prevent the disaster from happening. Uh, obviously, in hindsight, it's a lot easier to say, well, you know, they never should have flown the space shuttle when it was that cold out. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's easier in hindsight than it is uh, on the day of. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the goal is to design a system where there are more steps between you know, starting point and disaster and where there are more opportunities to break the chain. And a deadlock, if we want to consider it a tiny disaster, I mean, it is for your program, maybe, um, hopefully uh, not, not a dire one. But you know, if you consider it a disaster for your program, uh, occurs because of, well, a chain of things. There are four conditions, and if we can get rid of any one of them, deadlock doesn't happen. So our uh, four conditions are the following. Mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption, circular wait. All right, each of those requires a little bit of explanation. Um, mutual exclusion is that a resource belongs to at most one process at a time. If I phrase that in terms of our dear friends, the dining philosophers, it means that only one philosopher can be holding onto a chopstick at a given instant. That makes a certain amount of sense. It would be weird for two people to be trying to hold on to the chopstick at the same time, and you wouldn't even want that anyway because we can't both be using it to eat at the same time. Um, at, at best, we would take turns, and it would be gross and unsanitary, so we're not doing that. Hold and wait. A process that is currently holding some resources may request additional resources and may be forced to wait for them. 
So that is a philosopher has a chopstick in their left hand and they want to get the other chopstick, but it's currently in use. So the philosopher waits while holding on to the chopstick that they currently have. That is a hold and wait condition. We are holding on to something and, and at the moment waiting for another resource. The third condition, no preemption, says that a resource can't be forcibly taken from a process that holds it. Only the process currently holding the resource may voluntarily release it. We covered that when I said the philosophers are polite individuals. They don't rip chopsticks out of the hands of their colleagues. Uh, a philosopher can put a chopstick down when they're finished with it, but nobody can steal it from them. Nobody can take it from them. Uh, and the fourth condition is circular weight. That is a cycle in the resource allocation graph. Okay, I haven't defined a resource allocation graph, so we're going to have to come back to that. But if the first three conditions are true, deadlock is possible. So if those conditions hold, you know, there's mutual exclusion. We can have only you know, one person holding onto a chopstick, hold and wait. It's possible to hold onto a chopstick while you wait for another one uh, and no preemption. Nobody can steal this chopstick out of my hand. Then deadlock is possible. We live in a world where it could happen, but deadlock only happens if the fourth condition is fulfilled. That is to say, all of the philosophers sit down at the table at the same time and try to eat, you know, first by picking up the left chopstick. If they all try to do that, that will fulfill the fourth condition and a deadlock will occur. However, uh, up until that time, you know, there's, there isn't a problem, there's just a risk. Right, A risk, it means it could happen. A problem means it did. But okay, a resource allocation graph. What is it? A resource allocation graph, put simply, is a directed graph uh, such that it tells us the state of the system by representing processes and resources and telling us what resources are held by which processes and which ones are requested. So this is a sample graph shown on screen. A process is represented by a circle, uh, and again, you could imagine a thread in place of process, same difference. Uh, and so process P1, P2, and P3 appear in this diagram. A resource is a box labeled with R, so there's R1, R2, R3, R4, resource 1s, two, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, and uh, a uh, dot appears in the box representing each instance of the resource that is available. So a binary semaphore would look in a resource allocation graph like R1. It has one single black dot, uh, and therefore uh, you know, it can be requested by uh, exactly one thread at a time. A general semaphore would look uh, like, well, any of them. It could have one or more. So you could say R4 is a general semaphore. It has three uh, resource uh, instances that could be assigned. Most of the resources that you're gonna talk about have uh, you know, one instance, but we'll, uh, we'll let our resource allocation graph be general. And in this diagram, there are two kinds of edges. Uh, and there are request edges and there are assignment edges. A request edge is when a process wants a resource right now, but it can't have it because it's currently in use. An assignment edge is how we indicate that a resource is in use by a particular process. So a an edge that goes from P1 to R1, as is shown on the diagram, this is a request edge. P1 is requesting resource R1, so it wants to wait on the semaphore, um, but it isn't allowed to proceed right now. Why not? Because R1 is presently assigned to process P2, and there is an assignment edge uh, in that uh, in that graph, so from R1 to R2, uh, from sorry from R1 to P2, which indicates that uh, this resource R1 is assigned to process P2. Uh, when a request is made, a request edge is inserted into the graph. So if P3 requests R4 right now, then a request edge is inserted into that uh, graph, uh, and if the request can be fulfilled, it is instantly turned into an assignment edge. So, uh, so in that case, P3 doesn't have to wait because you know, there's no R4s that are in use, so getting it is no problem. Uh, and uh, when it has to wait, well, when the resource is granted, so imagine P2 releases resource R1, the assignment edge is deleted from the graph, 
uh, and one of the request edges, P1, here uh, to R1, will be transformed into an assignment edge. Okay, so that is uh, roughly how to read a resource allocation graph. Now, one of the things that we're going to look for in a resource allocation graph uh, is whether or not there is a cycle. I presume that you remember from uh, a data structures and algorithms course uh, or graph theory in general or any, any such similar uh, mathematical introduction about what is a cycle in the graph, keeping in mind that we have to you know, follow the directed edges. The, the way the arrow is pointing matters. We can't just you know, go backwards along one of those arrows. Uh, and we can look at this graph and I, I will ask you, you know, sort of just using uh, you know, your normal uh, human problem solving skills is there a cycle in this graph uh, it will not be a thing in this course to uh, you know, programmatically solve whether or not there is a cycle in the resource allocation graph uh, presumably you learned uh, how to do that again in a data structures and algorithms course is there a cycle in this graph we should see the answer to that is no now, if there are no cycles in a resource allocation graph then the system could not possibly be deadlocked. So if you can look at a resource allocation graph or you could build one based on what you know of the state of the system and there are no cycles in it, you are certain if there's no cycle, there is no deadlock. That doesn't run the other way though. If there is a cycle, then there could be a deadlock, but there isn't a guarantee that there is one. So looking at this resource allocation graph on screen, is there a cycle in it? Yes, there is. Uh, so we go P1 to R1, to P2, to R3, to P3, to R2, and R2 points back to P1. That's one of the cycles. There's, uh, you could also make the cycle the shorter one, where it's P2 to R3, to P3, to R2, to P2. That would tell you, okay, uh, there is a cycle in the graph, but does it mean there is a deadlock? Uh, in this case, the answer is yes there is a deadlock uh, and you know, P1 is waiting for process P2, P2 is waiting for P3, uh, and P3 is waiting for either one of P1 uh, and P2. If either one of those release the resource then uh, P3 could proceed. However, that's not going to happen because both of them are stuck as well. So yeah, this resource allocation graph does actually demonstrate a deadlock. But we have to you know, read it carefully. First, is there a cycle? Uh, and then if there is a cycle, is it one in which there is a deadlock? Because here uh, on this uh, third resource allocation graph, we have a cycle, but there's no deadlock. And why is that the case? Yeah, so uh, process P2 is not waiting on anything right now. So if process P2 finishes and releases a resource, it releases R1. R1 can then be assigned to P1 and it's unblocked. Uh, and you can make the same argument for P4. Uh, so P2 and P4 are not part of the cycle. Uh, and not only are they not part of the cycle, but they hold some resources that other processes in the cycle want. Uh, and therefore, when they release them, then you know, those processes will be able to proceed. So yeah, we'll take it. All right. Now, recognizing that deadlock uh, you know, is now defined, we, we have a model for uh, understanding it in, in our dining philosophers. Uh, we have a, uh, a way of grappling with it uh, in terms of um, you know, what do we what do we mean by deadlock and you know, it's conflict over resources and we have a way of even looking at a resource allocation graph but now we actually want to deal with it if we can and there are four basic approaches for dealing with deadlock and we're going to talk about all of them uh, and some of them obviously in a little more detail and some of them in a little less so option one is ignore it, also called the ostrich algorithm. Uh, although yes, I am given to understand that ostriches don't actually do this. And this is just one of those like myths that people uh, may believe. I don't know, I've uh, never seen an ostrich do it, but just because they don't do it when I'm looking doesn't mean they don't do it overall. Uh, but that is uh, just pretend it's not happening. 
Okay. Um, this is the approach that's taken by Windows, uh, by Mac OS, by you know, basically every operating system. Uh, I mean, some embedded systems maybe don't do this, but a lot of general purpose operating systems do this. Uh, and it is, we're just going to pretend that it doesn't happen, or if it does happen, it's the application developer's fault. Okay. Um, that seems like cruel and harsh and you know, mean to the users, but hey, I, I mean, if Microsoft can do it, why can't we? Uh, if processes get deadlocked, you might see, you know, not responding dialogue or you just see no process, uh, progress of your processes and you have to open task manager and start killing things. Um, that's, yeah, that, that's the thing. I mean, the, your operating system vendor, uh, whether it's uh, Microsoft or Apple or, or what have you, can push the problem off to uh, program authors and say, well, if you only wrote your program better, this wouldn't happen. Um you, um, well, you're the program author, so you can't really pass the buck on that one. You can blame users and you can say, users, you know, don't do this bad thing because it will cause a deadlock. But users will just tell you that uh, your system shouldn't allow them to do this bad thing in the first place. Well then. So, um, yeah, the ignore it option is, uh, well, I won't say it's useless because uh, you could actually choose it. But it's not very interesting. So we want to talk about one of the other options. And we're going to talk about deadlock prevention. And deadlock prevention says, look, I want to categorically rule out any possibility that deadlock could occur. I would like to live in a world where a deadlock cannot happen. And then if I live in a world where a deadlock cannot happen, then, well, it just won't. We don't have to concern ourselves with it. So, yeah, um, when I introduced the four things that go into deadlock, I said the uh, first three, mutual exclusion, hold and wait, and no preemption, are all necessary for deadlock to be possible. And you could think of them as being like pillars holding up the structure, where the structure is deadlock. And if we can eliminate one of those pillars, then deadlock is not possible. So like if we have a stool that has three legs and we can you know, just break off one of the legs, the stool will fall over and deadlock is defeated once and for all. I said once and for all. Now, uh, can you do this? Is this plausible? Is this something you can do in your program? Well, let's find out. Mutual exclusion is hard to get rid of. Um, the purpose of mutual exclusion was to prevent errors like inconsistent state or crashes or something like that. And so if you just, you know, went through your program and you said, you know, uh, I'm deleting all the lines that say pthread mutex anything, it does solve the problem. There will be no deadlock associated with that, but I would describe the cure as being worse than the disease. Your program is wrong. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It crashes. It has inconsistent state. Something is, like, terribly, horribly wrong now. So we didn't really fix it. So I wouldn't consider that acceptable as a solution. When it comes to your specific program, maybe you can make it so that mutual exclusion is not necessary for that specific program. So uh, if you can give each thread, just as an example, a copy of the data so they don't have to, um, they don't have to share anything, uh, or you can find some algorithm that no longer requires locking a given resource, then by all means, use it. Things like locking uh, other mutual exclusion constructs or things we use because we have to, not because we want to. You know, we don't wake up uh, and, and think to ourselves, you know, I really want to just put some more locks in this program just for kicks. Uh, it's there because it has to be. And if you could find a way to not need it, then that would work. That would eliminate mutual exclusion. But that's the exception rather than the rule. I'm assuming that you have it because you need it uh, and not just because... Uh, you want it. Okay, what about hold and wait? So to prevent a hold and wait condition, uh, we must guarantee that when a process or thread requests a resource, it doesn't have any other resource. That doesn't mean necessarily that things can only be requested one at a time. You, know, you don't have to request one byte at a time uh, and <laughs> release it to get the next one. Uh, you could request many things at once. Um, it, that would be like telling philosophers when you have one chopstick already, they can never get another. They would have to request two chopsticks at the same time. 
Um, and one way that this could happen is if you had something like, well, um, if program needs these three resources, R1, R2, R3, they all have to be requested right at the beginning of the program and you hold on to them the whole time. That's kind of not plausible. I mean, you can make an operating system that operates under these rules, but we know that our usual general purpose operating systems don't do this. You can imagine a world where everything is different, you know, rainbows, unicorns, whatever, but um, that's not very helpful when it comes to implementing the program that we want to write. Uh, you can't you know, go out on your co-op job and say, well, I wrote a program that would work in the magical world where this thing you know, doesn't happen. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't ship that. We can't deliver that code. Um, so requesting everything up front is kind of not possible. Um, a process would have to know in advance all the resources it will need, and you should know that a file is a resource. Uh, and if you open a simple text editor notepad, you can open any arbitrary file, and there's no way to know in advance which one it's going to be. So there's no solution to, there's no solution to that. Um, moreover, um, you could end up with weird performance implications that you, you can't start until you get everything in the world you were ever going to need. Uh, and that's not sensible either because processes would spend a lot of time waiting before starting. You know, if you're going to need the printer at some point ever when you have this document open, like, well, better wait until nobody is using the printer, even though that's ridiculous. I might be working on this document for an hour. Uh, and uh, why should I have to wait to start until the printer is finished? Um, in theory, a process that follows these rules might actually never start uh, if it is going to follow these rules. Now you might say, well, um, if I think about the philosophers, really the problem occurs because you know I'm holding onto this chopstick, uh, and I want to get the other one. So you know, could I put down the chopstick I have before trying to get the other one? Uh, and you can do this to a certain extent in your program, but not always. So a process that has resources R1 and R2 and it wants to get R3 could maybe put down those first two resources before requesting all three as a group. But not every resource is of the kind where you can just release it and expect to get it back again. If you free memory, uh, then it should go away. It can be collected and reassigned by the operating system. Uh, and we're certain, I think, at this point that you can't uh, you know, release all resources to avoid the hold and wait condition. Uh, and you could try to do this as a way to reduce the possibility of deadlock, but it's not a solution. We could make deadlock less likely to occur, but it's still a risk. So uh, as Arnold would say, uh, put that chopstick down. No, I, I should do the voice, shouldn't I? Put that chopstick down now. So what about two-phase locking? So in two-phase locking, we do something a little bit different. A process attempts to lock a group of resources, and it may be partially successful. So I, I asked to lock these three things, and I only got one of the three. If I only got one of the three, well, then I will unlock the one that I got and go back to the start and try to acquire all three again. Thus, the process doesn't wait while holding onto resources. So if the philosopher picks up a chopstick and is unable to acquire the second one, then, yeah, two-phase locking says they will put down the chopstick that they picked up, uh, and they will start the process again from the beginning. Try again. Did I get any this time? Maybe I got none. That's okay. I'll try again. When I try for the third time, maybe I get both chopsticks, and then I can eat, and then I can put them down. That is a particular implementation of two-phase locking. Okay, um, the problem that we face is that two-phase locking is not really applicable to our current model for semaphores. There's no check function that tells us what is the internal value of the semaphore, uh, and the operating system will block uh, a process on wait if some other thread is in a critical section or something like that. Um, and after the process gets blocked on the semaphore, something else runs, the first process doesn't get the opportunity to release the resources that it holds. 
right? If you did wait on chopstick one and you got it and then wait on chopstick two, you get blocked immediately. There's no, there's no chance. There's no, uh, there's no opportunity that you have to say, well, I'm going to get blocked. So I want to release this uh, chopstick one before I get there. What do we do about that? Um, well, I mean, there are non-blocking requests for mutual exclusion. Uh, and if you use one of them, then it's your responsibility to check and see if you were successful in acquiring the resource. So in our current uh, simple model for a semaphore, you call sem wait, uh, you get blocked or you don't. Uh, but if you don't get blocked, you proceed immediately. You, know, you, you did succeed, it is your turn. Uh, if you do get blocked, you're blocked for a while, but when your thread gets unblocked, it's because it's your turn and then you can proceed immediately uh, and you don't have to worry about it. With a non-blocking request, you try to lock the resource and you get told either yes or no. And it's your responsibility to check and see was the answer yes or was the answer no. Okay, so what would we need to actually do this? How, how would this work? How could we adapt what we know about semaphores to have non-blocking requests? Okay, if you uh, were, were watching in the uh, segments where we talked about uh, locking a semaphore, you know, the actual like, code function calls for it, uh, and uh, same for the reader's writer's locks, which hopefully isn't uh, too far uh, away in your mind since it was the previous lecture, uh, we know how to do this already. Uh, I've actually introduced the functions and the function signatures that we need. I just said, oh yeah, we'll come back to that later. Yeah, the try lock functions that I previously introduced. Uh, obviously, there is uh, the regular try lock for a mutex, uh, and there is a try read lock function and a try write lock function. Uh, all of these are quite simple to invoke. They take a pointer to the thing that you want to lock. But the key difference between them and any of the other lock type functions uh, is that they return an integer, and it is critical to check what the return code is. These functions return zero if we have acquired the lock. Uh, the call is non-blocking, so it carries on regardless. We go on to the next statement whether we were successful or unsuccessful. So the correct thing to do is assign the result and check it or you know, check this in a loop or something such that we try to enter the critical section only when we succeed in locking Otherwise, we shouldn't. Uh, otherwise, we would have more than one thread in a critical section. For a lot of scenarios, trilock doesn't make a great deal of sense. Uh, if you have nothing to do in the meantime and you were just going to wait anyway, then getting blocked is just as good. Uh, but it can prevent this deadlock from happening because we can eliminate a hold and wait condition with it. So if deadlock is a risk, then you can avoid this problem altogether. So here is a simple code example that uh, represents a little bit of the uh, philosopher's behavior. Have you tried trying? Uh, and it should be possible, as it says on the slide, to reason about this solution and demonstrate that number one, a philosopher can only eat if they have both chopsticks, uh, and number two, deadlock does not occur. So going over the code, lock both is zero at the beginning of this function. Uh, and while lock both is zero, we will try to lock chopstick one and chopstick two, uh, and we will assign those values to um, Assign those values to local variables locked one and locked two. If locked one is not zero, but locked two is zero, that means we failed at acquiring chopstick one, but we succeeded in acquiring chopstick two. We will therefore unlock chopstick two, so figuratively speaking, put it down, uh, and then go around uh, to the next iteration of the loop. If locked one is zero and locked two is not zero, that means we successfully acquired chopstick one, uh, and we did not acquire chopstick two. Uh, that being the case, we will unlock chopstick one, go back around to the next iteration of the loop and try again. If we failed actually at acquiring both of them, so locked one is not zero and locked two is not zero, there's nothing to unlock, we just try again. 
and the else case covers what happens if locked one is, uh, is zero and lock two is zero. Uh, and that means we did successfully lock both of them. We can break out of the loop and we can call the eat function. Uh, and then when we're done, unlock chopstick one and unlock chopstick two. Okay. So yeah, is there any possibility that a philosopher uh, tries to eat without both chopsticks? No. We check the return values for try lock for both of them. Uh, and accordingly, uh, we only break out of the loop if both of those are zero. So that will work. Uh, but deadlock does not occur. Why? Because there are no blocking calls in this code. There is no way that we can get stuck because uh, pthread mutex try lock, as I say, is not blocking. It is a system call, but it is a regular system call, and it will return a value, and we will continue executing. So there's no uh, possibility. Uh, same thing, unlock is not blocking. We can't get blocked uh, on calling it, so nothing to be concerned about there. There are no statements that could cause us to get blocked, and therefore deadlock will not occur because our definition of deadlock requires our threads to be permanently blocked. You can uh, think about, could I make this code more efficient? Uh, there are potentially some improvements that you could make to it, such as don't bother trying to acquire chopstick two if locking chopstick one has already failed. Um, that would have, uh, that would have been a uh, slight improvement to this. That's okay. Um, this does not have to be optimal, it just has to work. Uh, you could also mix and match a bit um, with that solution. So you could do a regular blocking lock on locked one maybe, uh, and then try lock on lock two or something, but that's more advanced and reasoning about it is harder. The goal of this was just to explain and demonstrate how does try lock behavior work. There does exist a try function for the semaphore as well. It is sem try wait. Uh, this one did not appear, I believe, uh, earlier when I uh, showed the functions for uh, manipulating a semaphore. Um, if you would have been blocked uh, on sem try wait, it returns negative one, uh, and the error number variable is set to e again, you know, as in try again. Now. For a lot of cases uh, in this, this situation, uh, if I just go back, um, we would spin around trying to lock the mutex and unlock the mutex you know, repeatedly, and that's kind of inefficient. We're wasting some CPU time. Try lock works best when we have something else to do in the meantime. That is, we would like to you know, enter the critical section, but we can't right now, but that's okay. We'll do a different thing, and then we'll come back and we'll try again later. For a lot of scenarios where we have nothing to do, uh, and we just want to enter into a critical section, just getting blocked is fine, we'll just wait. You know, there's no reason why we should, uh, why we should try uh, in a loop, uh, especially something like the loop that's shown here where it is a tight loop. If the uh, critical section, you know, if chopstick one and two are in use for a significant amount of time, the, the thread that's running this code wastes a lot of effort trying to acquire those chopsticks, even though it's going to be a while until they are ready. So you have to be careful about use of try lock. It's not magic. Uh, it's not uh, ideal for every situation. But it does potentially allow us to get out of the no preemption, uh, sorry, the uh, no, no hold and wait condition. What about no preemption? Okay, um, preemption requires a definition. No, not that thing that I haven't defined. Um, so preemption is the forcible removal of resources from a process. So if P1 holds R1 and R2 wants to get it, uh, and R2 wants R3, but R3 is unavailable. Um, in theory, the operating system could block uh, process P1 and steal its resource and give it to another process, what have you. Um, and uh, then you know, P1 is blocked waiting for that resource that it had and was taken away. So you're a philosopher, you have a chopstick in your hand, and your colleague next to you steals it right out of your grip, uh, and then you are stuck, you are waiting for them to return it before you can continue eating. Um, not great. Um, for preemption to work, as you might imagine, whatever resource we're talking about has to be a resource where uh, the type has to be the kind that you can uh, save and restore. So CPU with his registers is a good example of this that would work. 
that's not something that you have a lot of control over uh, as a uh, program designer. Uh, and moreover, it's not applicable to all resources. Uh, so if a printer is in use by P1, it can't be preempted and given to P2 because uh, you can't just stop printing my document you know, one quarter of the way through uh, and then print somebody else's document. The printout will be a jumble. That doesn't work. That's not cool. So pre uh, preemption uh, on its own, if it's even available to you, again, requires the operating system's help, uh, doesn't prevent deadlock from happening because you can't steal memory. You, know, you can't steal the printer, those kinds of things. So it really only makes uh, deadlock less likely. It doesn't stop it altogether from happening. So... Um, yeah, when, when we finish talking about deadlock prevention, uh, we end up finding that it's not great. The only one where we have even a little bit of a chance is uh, preventing the hold and wait condition. Uh, and even that uh, is restricted to the kind of resource for which, number one, try weight is available, and number two, try weight makes sense. Uh, they don't, if resources being fought over are not the kind where you can try lock or try wait, then you can't really get rid of hold and wait because you, know, you can be holding on to memory and waiting for more memory, while other processes are holding on to memory and waiting for more memory, and there's no try malloc kind of behavior necessarily. So we might be kind of out of luck. We uh, learned a useful tool, don't get me wrong, try lock is good uh, as a way of preventing. Uh, a deadlock as a way of uh, staying out of trouble, but it's not uh, for every situation, and it means ultimately that we cannot live in a world where no deadlock could ever occur. There are things we can do that can make it uh, less likely, but we haven't categorically eliminated deadlock as a possibility. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, when we come back in the next lecture, we're going to talk about, well, deadlock avoidance. Uh, and deadlock avoidance is based on the premise that if we can't stop deadlock from ever existing in the world, uh, we can't rule it out categorically, uh, and we have to live in a world where it could happen, we'll just try very hard to stay out of trouble uh, and make it so deadlock doesn't happen by being careful. So we'll uh, pick up again in that next video. See you then.